Welcome to the MMHP and the 989, channeling all styles and eras of Michigan music history. Hello, Michigan music lovers. This is Scott Baker. I want to welcome you to the Michigan Music History Podcast. I am flanked by Michigan Music Royalty. To the left, Dr. J. To the right, Sir Fred. We cut from just around the block of the Michigan Rock Legends Hall of Fame in Bay City, Michigan, here at Studio 163 in Essexville. And now it's time to grab a favorite beverage, hit the cruise, and take a trip back with us through Michigan's rich music history. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric, Electric Kitsch, Kitsch, located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. And now, here's your host, Scott Baker. Yeah, well, you know, with Clark here, this Clark will be our first guest from the UP. True. Oh, yes. Right. right. We're going to utilize that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. We're going to talk a little bit about growing up in uh, Republic. Yeah. Well, be, well, Republic. We're both yeah. from the UP. Oh, really, Bobby? You're from the UP, too? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So did you guys know each other back in the day? Well, that's where we met. Yeah. Wow. How old were you when you met? Oh. I don't know, 20? Yeah. So it was after high school? Yes. Okay. It was after high school. Okay. Well, we were playing at, at the Music, music Manor. Manor. Yeah. Which was just a fabulous place in Marquette. So oh, you were okay. playing too? What? Were you playing too? Oh, God, no. <laughs> oh, he, he said we were playing. I'm like, We, we were, were the band. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, came with a friend of hers and... Uh, Sell him? What? Came with Steve and saw you and saw the band. And yeah, yeah. They did it. Yeah, yeah. wow. Well, the the XLs were yeah. number one in the UP, yeah. without a doubt. Yeah. Well, I'm good. Um, before we start, Clark, um, mm -hmm. I'd like to do some sort of UP thing down the road at the museum. Mm -hmm. Do you have much uh, memorabilia or anything like that you could loan the museum uh, from the XL days? I'd have to look and see what I have. Yeah, I could do. Yeah. I know there was a uh, a poster. I don't know who has it. No, we did the UP swings with the Buckinghams and uh, what the association. Yeah. You know, different things like well, that. that see, uh, see if I could get something. Yeah, like that probably was a pretty big tour back in the day. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, I've got, well, there's three UP bands. Um the uh, Riot Squad from Escanaba. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever played with those guys. I know who they are. Okay, yeah. and apparently uh, Jim Jacques has got, or is trying to round up some memorabilia, and uh, I had been in contact with uh, the son of the, well, uh, there's no one that's, uh, no surviving members left of the Galaxies from Ironwood. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. That uh, you was know, earlier than us, I think, even, the Galaxies. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, that was, uh, well, they were 1950s. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, you know, they had at least one national release, and yeah. Jimmy Bowen produced uh, their first single anyway. So I, that would have been probably the first band to come out of the UP then? Well, but I don't know. With a national hit? Well, they didn't really have a national or hit. how you call it. But, uh, you know, to have a, a recording on a national label, that's yeah, a pretty yeah. big deal. Yeah, of course, yeah. the XLs had several. Yeah, uh, yeah. But um, I think, uh, in fact, the, the Galaxies, I think there was a Sullivan in that group. Too. Yes. Yeah, and it's his Danny Sullivan's son. Okay. Who is the one. And I think they've got some kind of, uh, um, I'm not sure exactly where it is in Ironwood, but there's some sort of display somewhere about the galaxies okay okay and yeah there was a lot of support it must have been everybody in ironwood oh, <laughs> voting yeah. for the band yeah, back yeah, in the back yeah. of the day there so that's where buddy holly's uh drummer ended up holding hurley after he froze his seat on that winter tour party <laughs> they came through the up and then uh yeah so yeah that whole thing with ironwood and hurley is kind of an interesting story oh, yeah. you know divided by the river hurley's yeah. wild side oh, of town shoot. and yeah. that was up there 
Hmm? You could drink in her life. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. Not, yeah. not the other side. Nope. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's there's the reason for the wildness right well, there. No, we won't. Oh, that yeah. was a wide open town. <laughs> well, oh, we got to go there. No, not just I don't know what it is more. now, but <laughs> yeah, everybody say you got to go. You got to go to Hurley Hill. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a movie made, uh, a Hollywood movie that kind of dealt with uh, the early days of Hurley. I, I'm trying to think what the name of it is now. Uh, it's been so long ago since I wrote that story on the uh, the galaxies, but uh, interesting history. Well, anyways, we're we got to get. Rolling I think we're here. good. I think we're going already. It's it's good. I we have a special guest, Clark Sullivan, in the house, uh, all the way from the UP. Even though he doesn't live there anymore, I imagine. <laughs> Where do you live now, Clark? We live in Swartz Creek. Swartz Creek. So you made a little bit of a trek over here to Essex. Oh, thank oh, you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. And uh, we are going live here from Studio 163 in Essexville and a little bit of a pre-talk tonight because uh, we've got quite the tale here. Gary's got a, a well-written history that's going to be that you'll be able to find on our on our site from his Rock and Roll uh, Hall of Fame page there. And we're going to um, you can direct to that and you can uh, counter direct to this podcast here as well as and uh Clerk's going to fill in all the little gaps of the history here. <laughs> and uh, so between Dr. J and Sir Fred, how you doing, Sir Fred? I'm doing real good. Good. Mike Beatty's in the house. How you doing, Mike? Doing great. Thank you. Our archivist is here. Well, we're going to um, just keep the chat going. I mean, it's already yeah. been going great. So you, we, there's well, a, there was I, a band I, before the Excels. Uh, and then... Yeah, well, there's a, there are a lot of bands in the UP, but uh, I think without a doubt the Excels were... The, the the one UP band that really, I think, uh, made some noise outside of the UP. And they are in the Rock Legends Hall? Oh, yeah, yeah. definitely. That's what I thought I read. So anyways, uh, I, you know, Clark, you grew up in a, a pretty interesting town, Republic, mm -hmm. one of the big mining towns, iron mining towns of the UP. So, what was that like growing up? You were born in the in the forties, and uh, were kind of a you were, you were a teenager when Elvis came on the scene in fifty six, fifty seven. Fifty seven. I was twelve years old. Okay. Yeah, and you had to say back in the forties. <laughs> hey, we're yeah, we're from yeah. the same territory. Yeah. So is yeah. Fred. Yeah. Uh, so, what was it like growing up in a, a mining town like Republic? It would seem like almost everything in town was connected to the mine in some way. Well, basically, yeah, because uh, a lot of our parents and that worked for the mine. And uh, a lot of lumber industry there, too. We had uh, people go out, you know, and cut trees down and things like that. But it was a great place to grow up. I mean, we were right on the Michigami River. And uh, it was a clean little town, and it was a great town. And we had WLS out of Chicago, so that was our big station at the time. So we were connected. So you had a pretty clear signal oh, up yeah. there from WLS? That was our main station. Everybody listened to WLS. Occasionally you'd pick up CKLW when they went to 50,000 watts or whatever, but uh, WLS, Dick Biondi, Art Roberts, and that, and we eventually worked with a lot of our DJ idols from WLS. So. I, you know, when, when I was doing the story and interviewing you, as well as the other guys in the band, uh, one of the really fascinating things to me was uh, in Republic when they switched to an open pit mine and actually had to move parts of the town. Yep. <laughs> Can you describe a little bit what that must have been like? Well, they were going to move the whole town because uh, they were planning on big things and uh, they got half of it moved. So we have North and South Republic. Now it's almost like a... Uh, okay. A big thing, but it's not. And uh, mainly they were going to do that and uh, move everything out to the south side. And it never came to fruition that they would move that. So, But it was different. You see these houses and churches and everything on these big trailers moving out to South Republic. And uh, it... It was an interesting time, believe me, because you didn't know who was going to go next. <laughs> yeah. how, old, how old were you when that was going on? Oh, I was in, I think, uh, 
early teens. Were you so? Was your school moved to, or anything that drastically t- touched your life as well during that time period? Well, I was the last to graduate from our old high school in 1963 in Republic, and uh, uh, after that, they built a new school in South oh. Republic. So, so you uh, were able to hang out at hang the school out, you were at. Good. Bet, good, bet. good, good, good. So, did the mine play out, or? What happened that, that the mining thing kind of went south in Republic? Well, I think uh, what happened in a few mines up there, they just they didn't run out of ore. I don't know if it was cost effective or whatever it was, but uh, eventually it just closed down. And we had quite a bit of a population drop after that because, you know, people weren't working in town anymore. So. Right. And it wasn't actually right in town. It was... Oh, geez, it was way behind our school. It was called Smith's Mountain. In fact, it was a big, high place. And uh, when they blasted, you could, they, you'd could you hear the thing, and all of a sudden there'd be a big rumble, and the house would shake. But interesting wow. times. Yeah. Wow. yeah. So out of that, you started playing music. Uh, and that was inspired by seeing Elvis on uh, Ed Sullivan or whatever you saw him for the well, first time? Well, uh, I started with guitar. My mother played some guitar and uh, piano and stuff like that. And uh, she taught me my first chords. Uh, my uncle also played, so he taught me a few more chords. So I was up to probably a C minor or something like that, putting in the <laughs> sevenths. And, and then I had a friend out of Republic. His name was Richard Jilha. Down here, I think it's Jaila or something. Uh, yeah. On Channel 5 at one time. Right, man. Yeah. Eric, Eric Jaila. Eric Jaila. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It was Yilha because there are a lot of Finnish people up in the UP, and <laughs> that was how that was pronounced. So, yeah, but then hearing that, and uh, like I said, with uh, the local radio stations and uh, seeing Elvis in his first thing, I thought, geez, this is interesting. This is something that maybe I'd like to do, you know, and uh, that really lit the the fire yeah i mean i think a lot of people um you know that are you know you think of elvis you think of him in the jumpsuits and the las vegas right. elvis but elvis in the 1950s mm. that was that was just like a an atomic bomb going off he was so different and so cool compared to anybody else that uh, yeah, he made an um, you know an immense impact. I know the first time I saw him, I think I was nine years old, uh-huh. and this was before Ed Sullivan on the uh, Dorsey Brothers stage show. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know I was just I couldn't believe it. It was he was so different. Uh, I hadn't seen anything like it before. Well, so. I came to the realization. In fact, uh, my cousin who was a few years older than I, uh, her name was Sharon, took me to see this. Uh, I don't know what one of the early ones. It wasn't uh, "Love Me Tender" or that what, that first one. Yeah, it must have been yeah, either "Love uh, Me Tender." Well, that was the first one, right? right. But the the ones where Elvis kind of played a rock and roll singer. Yeah, uh, yeah that was yeah. "Loving You" loving or you. "Jailhouse Rock" or yeah, loving "King Creole." Those loving, were the yep. the three biggies of the nineteen fifties. Well, the theater that we went to was that was called the Vista Theater in Nagani. That's where Bobby's from, and. Uh, Geez, it was packed, <laughs> and I didn't believe it. When he came on stage, there were so many screaming people in there, and I mean, this is just the movie. People are just screaming, like going crazy, you know, watching this, and I thought, geez, yeah, that, that looks like fun. Yeah, you know, and there's the only other thing I could even compare that to were the Beatles, because mm-hmm. I remember going out to the old Starlight Drive-In in Bay City to see A Hard Day's Night, mm-hmm. and... Uh, they were screaming from the cars, you know, when the Beatles were on the screen. You know, it was just that much of a phenomena, just like it was in Elvis in 56 or 57. Were you at a drive-in theater? Yeah. Okay, because uh, the band, the XLs, we went to see it at a drive-in theater, I think, uh, Taylor, Michigan, somewhere down near Detroit. And like you, people were screaming from their cars. We thought, oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is something. Well, you know, it was in a drive-in because nobody could really imagine that a rock and roll movie, you know, would have that kind of impact mm-hmm. that, it, you know, it would go into a, a traditional theater, you know, so right. just drive-in fair, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was really something else. Mm-hmm. So you went through, you had a couple other bands that uh, you were in before you uh, met the guys that became the XLs, right? Well, really... 
it was just with a high school friend of mine, and uh, uh, I picked up a drummer from Ishpeming. Uh, that's between uh, Republic and Nagani up there. And uh, we formed a little trio, and we played at a few dances and had a good time. And uh, that was about it. We got our first job because my cousin, she was the head of the youth center in Republic. We only knew a few songs, but uh, they hired us back. Yeah. Well, it was probably a novelty, you know, to see people actually playing rock and roll music yeah. live, especially young people at that time. Yeah. You know, it was, a, it was pretty unusual. But there was no screaming. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe get off the stage or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did well, but uh, it seems uh, that whenever we started the band or part of the band, we started out playing our first gigs with maybe six or seven songs, you know, so we have to make every song maybe 10, 12 minutes. That's pretty hard to do, but... <laughs> Just re repeating those right, verses right, over and over. Right. Backtracking a little, Clark, did, you said you learned some chords from your mom and your, and your uh, uncle, was it? Yeah. Um, were you singing at all in church or school, or was there a choir involved, or how did your vocals uh, come, come forward? No, I didn't do any singing. I played sports, and that's so you couldn't get in the chorus or the band, so... Um, I just started, uh, my mother, she would sing a bit too, and then, like I said, when I got with this uh, Richard Jill there, he was a very good guitar player, and uh, he would sing. He had the worst voice in the world, but uh, we started doing some harmony and stuff like that, and I said, well, this is fun. Came natural. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Wow. So, so things really started to come together uh, when you got up to Marquette, right? Mm-hmm. Borner's Music uh, Store. Uh, I used to stop in there, pick up strings and uh, different uh, things for guitar. And I stopped in there one day and I uh, um, was playing the guitar and, and walked Dick Manning and uh, Carl Holm. Dick Manning was giving guitar lessons at the time at Borner's. And we sat down and I, the first song I sang and it was uh robin luke susie darling oh yeah and carl says Geez, that sounds pretty good well i didn't know if it sounded good or whatever but he thought it did and uh geez he says why don't you come and join us i said i don't know that's a long way to drive over to iron river michigan and uh, i said well yeah i'll give it a shot and dick manning had a uh, his father had a gas station with the, the bays in it, so we set up our equipment in there, and that's where the XL started, was in that uh, gas station in Iron River, Michigan. So. Wow. Now, at that point, you weren't attending Northern Michigan yet, or, or, or were you about to? I was about to. I graduated in the spring of 63, well, in May of 63, and this started uh, probably about the end of May, and we practiced there, and um boy it really sounded good people would stop by and say geez you guys have to play here or play there and uh uh it progressed from there and we played uh in fact uh getting ahead of myself here we had learned maybe five songs and i was out at a friend's cabin in republic and my dad drove up and he says uh you better get back to the house. He says, you guys are playing tonight. I said, what? I, this is only five or six songs now. And it was at a place in, uh, uh, not Sparta, just across the border into Wisconsin. And uh, he says, yeah, Carl had booked a job, or Steve had booked a job. And uh, so off we go. It was a, called a hideaway bar and. uh Wisconsin and we played and they they liked it and they hired us back and we started with that and what what had happened is that uh, John Zelinsky who was our drummer at the time and Dick Manning John Zelinsky's father had a very very good polka band and he wanted John to continue in the polka business so we pressured him there we lost John Dick Manning, he was after some girl on that, and he was all in love in that, and we lost him. So 
along came Terry Quirk and Steve Contardi, who had known Carl before because uh, they had all went to school together. And that's when the XLs really started. It was John Zelensky, though, our original drummer, who gave us the name, the XLs. Yeah, and, and that was after the car, right? The Ford yeah, Galaxy yeah, XL? Yeah. yeah, they were driving on the street and they saw yeah, X- XL, right. and so <laughs> that's where that came from. Well, yeah. pretty popular to, uh, to use car names. I mean, yeah, there's so yeah, many groups yeah. that did that. I don't know how many string rate groups I knew. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, So, yeah, that's about... Like I said, the the start of the XLs. So and, then, when you're at Marquette, you're studying, but yet playing like on weekends and that kind of thing at the at the college or in in clubs around Marquette. Gary, when 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 you put studying first and then <laughs> playing, it was playing and then studying. <laughs> uh, we uh, uh, we were playing around the area like up at Michigan Tech and different places like this and then when we started at uh, uh, Northern um, we started a few outdoor concerts you know we just plug in wherever and geez we we're starting to get a lot of the students coming around and they loved it in fact we've had hundreds at a time you know just out in the parking lots and that and it really grew from there because a lot of these students were from downstate Wisconsin, Minnesota, and they started spreading the word about the XLs. And so that's that's where a lot of this started where we got to go down below the bridge and in these other states. And at that time too, we picked up Kenny Forrest, who was a keyboard man. And so we became a five member group. And so, Do you remember your, your first gigs uh, in the Lower Peninsula? Was it like around oh, yeah. Traverse City or oh, that yeah. area? We played our first gigs, I think, were at, uh, what's the name, Ponytail Club? Oh, yeah, Harbor Beach. Harbor Beach, and uh, I think it was there. They had the Beach Boys. They had Jan and Dean, all of those things. And so Bobby Vinton, I uh, was there when we were there. So um, you opened for Bobby Vinton? Well, we didn't open for him, but see, we were playing the outdoor venue. And... Uh, he, he he didn't have any opening act. He would come on in the inside and do his show and that. And um, Same with uh, Jan and Dean. That there was no opening acts. There was just two venues, okay. the outside and inside. And in the winter, we played the inside one. And so, uh, yeah, kids from all over there. But uh, I think our biggest break uh, was when we uh, crossed the bridge we had some students that were from Gaylord, and they had a fabulous teen club there called the Teen Chalet. Right. And uh, we were on our way down to Detroit and uh, trying to, you know, hook up with some record stuff and that. And uh, we stopped by the Teen Chalet. All they had was uh, auditions and that. The owner's name was Dan Lewis the Third. And uh, he had a, a group of high school girls that were who he had auditioned for. So uh, we we set up. Uh, I remember the song. It was Help Me, Rhonda. And uh, we didn't even finish the song. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> and uh, we played that place, I don't know how many times. And it was just packed all the time. And so that open up things down the uh, below the bridge. We heard from uh, Traverse City. Elmer Ogden had the Tons House, and uh, we played there so many times too. And that was back in the day when uh, Glenn Fry was had his group, the Mushrooms, and that, and you know, just trying to make it right. like the rest of us. He was a little bit more successful than we were, but <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it took a while. Though. Yeah, yeah. Well, same with Bob Seger. I mean, you know, yeah. he, he was at it for you know, 10 or so years before he hit it big nationally. You bet. Yeah. In yeah, fact, we, tough worked, road to hoe. we worked with uh, Bob at uh, Rooster Tail in uh, Detroit on Jefferson, and I have never seen a more dedicated artist. I mean, he would get off the stage, we did our set, he'd do his set, then we'd do another set, and so on, and 
he was just sweating bullets because he, how did I do? How did I do? He was so involved with his music, and I give him credit for that. And then we'd meet up again when he'd play up at Tatan's house in Traverse City, too. And so, you know, and Daniel's dead. So Right. But, uh, well, you guys had, you know, looking at those early uh, publicity pictures, mm -hmm. uh, you had the, uh, the short sleeve striped shirts, definitely had the Beach Boys kind of look that's what i remember yeah and, and Dan. right and and you also had the the harmonies that could kind of back it up right well that was they were our idols because that's what we were looking for there was a group i think i told you this before uh it still idolized them they were called the rhythm rockers from the up mm -hmm. and they had such great harmony and such great musicians that gee this is what we want because all of us love harmonies and so where do you go for that? You don't go to the Rolling Stones, that you go to the Beach Boys. And uh, we were able to uh, sort of put that together and do a lot of that, the Four Seasons Association and that, and that's what worked in for us. And we thought, geez, we don't want to wear suits on the stage. You know, we're not the Beatles or that. That's a different genre, you know, what we were used to. So the striped shirts and the, the white Flax or whatever, you know, that worked for us. And so yeah. people got to know us like that. Did but, you play with the Beach Boys? Yeah. Um, was that the ponytail you said earlier? Uh, no, I think that was that was an early in the career when they were coming through. I think that was Milwaukee, someplace in Wisconsin. You was. shared the stage with them, huh? Pardon? You shared the stage with them at that point? Or, did you open for them? Or yeah, well, yeah. it was, you know, there was like about uh, three or four bands that were on on the bill with that. And okay. So that's that's all that. No. Did they have anything to say to you, being that you were so much like them? No, we had to change our. We didn't. Ha <laughs> we didn't play any Beach Boys stuff. <laughs> I mean, that, that I was, wonder how that that was hard to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. because. Uh, <laughs> you can't go and do uh, uh, Help Me Ronda or anything. Well, that was before that, but uh, yeah, anything like that because, geez. Yeah, that would have been bad yeah. form. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, but uh, yeah, all of those groups, and uh, we were uh, pleased that we were able to get into Wisconsin and Illinois and stuff. That's drew us through there. Eventually, then we'd go to Milwaukee, and then uh, where did we play with the association? Was that Green Bay? That was Brown County Arena, wasn't it? So we'd pick up a lot of the the groups out of Wisconsin, then do the UP thing, because that's uh, you know, uh, a bigger venue like the Brown County Arena in uh, Green Bay was something that was huge. So, yeah. Well, you made, uh, you made quite a a leap you know to head down to detroit mm -hmm. in search of a a record deal just kind of on your own right you didn't really have anything set up with a, with a manager or anything like that mm -hmm. and you tell us a little bit your first stop was at hitsville right right well i'll say we got to detroit and we stayed with uh, ken forrest's parents and that and so we drove into detroit so we went to hitsville and uh went in and uh, there are the Supremes. They're sitting there, you know, talking to us. We started talking to them, and then I think it was Barry Gordy, and they weren't doing any really white acts at the time. And uh, uh, Smokey Robbins had said, well, you know, you got to go see Ollie McLaughlin. He's, you know, he's an up-and-coming guy, and he's, I think he had, I don't know how many... He was like the number 20th pr producer that year and, you know, like uh, Cashbox and that, all the songs he had all. So we went, and I don't care what band member said it was Golden World. It was not. It was uh, United Sound. Boy. Yeah, I think you're right, because at that point, um, yeah, well, Motown hadn't bought Golden World mm -hmm. yet. Um, but, yeah, I think that's where Ali did most of his where right. it was at United Sound. I didn't read anything about him ever working at Golden World. Right, because I remember it because the uh, the the booth was up high. You had to go upstairs to get to the booth, and Golden World didn't have that. It was on the same level. So we see Ollie, and Ollie is just such a personable guy, always has been, and no pretentious stuff about the man. I mean, you just 
he was a friend right from the start. And he says, hey, what are you guys up to? He said, you, you have a band? He says, yeah, we got a band. He said, I'd like to listen to some stuff or hear some stuff that you do. And he said, uh, I said, oh, we're not from down here, but we're going to school up in the UP of Michigan. And he said, well, could you write a few things and, you know, send them to me? So that's how that started. And uh, we got back to the UP and we wrote a couple songs, sent it to him. And he says, we're going to record in the spring. So that's how that started. And what year was that then in the spring when you started recording with Alley? I was think it meant 65 or 66? I think it was 65. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Electric Kitsch. Located at 2106 Kosciusko Avenue in Bay City, Michigan. They offer new and used records, including local to Michigan original vinyl and CDs, as well as clothing, electronic equipment, funky household items, music gear, and stringed instrument repair. You can find them on the web or call 989-402-1411. Going down there, did you already have a little bit of songs written already? Or do you, no. Do you, not at all. No. Not at all. Hey? No. So you didn't even think around. Writing songs, and said, "We can't do that." <laughs> really? Yeah. Okay. I wondered yeah. about yeah. That, how that yeah. you were after a record thing when no, with no songs. Okay. Yeah. No. So how did you get the songs down to him? Did you mail him? Like, uh, yeah, put on a little two-track recorder, and yeah. uh, we wrote a couple songs and sent it down. We get a call back, and he says, "Yeah, I like this," you know, and uh, we 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 trusted Ollie, and after. Charlie Westover had big success. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, quite a bit of success. And that really grabbed us when we saw that, you know, he had really discovered Del Shannon. And, uh, well, Barbara Lewis, too. Barbara Lewis, yeah. yeah. Yeah, in fact, Barbara, I think at one time, babysat for him over there, and you know, when he was in Ann Arbor. But, uh, yeah, we were pretty impressed with Ollie. Still am. Still yeah. miss him. Yeah, and uh, he was always good to... Bobby and I, and uh, uh, we valued the, the friendship of Ollie, and we're so glad that we got to meet him and know him as a friend. So. And not only a producer, but also a label owner. A label owner. And mm-hmm. had three three different record labels named after his three daughters. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. and you guys were on Carla, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I remember when we were in New York, uh, uh Ahmed Erdogan and uh, Jerry Wexler. We went to I went to a meeting with them with Ollie, and they were pushing for us to go on the Atlantic brand on the Atco thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, Ollie says, N- "No," he says, "I would like to keep the label. I want to build up in that." And I agreed with them. You know, I mean, if we had something that was going to be saleable, you know. Um, I really trusted Ollie, but it would have probably been to our better advantage to get on that Atco or Atlantic label. Oh, yeah. Because uh, Atco, they had the distribution in that, but a lot of the music coming from Ollie was R&B and things like that, and we were not an R&B group. but uh, You were on an R&B label. Yeah, R&B mm-hmm. label. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and his labels uh, distributed by Atlantic? Yes, yeah. they were. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. So we had distribution there, and... Hindsight's always twenty twenty, though. You, you at the time you believed in what you saw, yep. and now you look back and you know why it didn't work, and you know what you could have done. But you know, yep. you yep. went with what you went with. You made your decision. Yeah, well, Ollie did break some songs nationally, but they were R and B songs. You know, yep. "Cool Jerk" and cool uh, jerk, yeah. "Love Makes the World Go Round" by Deion Jackson. But yep. yeah, I see your you know your point is well taken that yep. uh, you guys were maybe not the greatest fit for the label. Uh, despite putting out some really good records. Well, I tell you what, um, I have no regrets. I mean, you know, to have that experience, because uh, uh, maybe things would have changed, you know, with this national distribution on an ATCO or Atlantic, and uh, would, it would have been fine. But I, we had such a faith and such a admiration for Ollie. I have no regrets on how things had worked out. I tell you, I don't know if I could have survived, you know. By the time, uh, like, Little Innocent Girl came out, I think we were married then. Now we've been married for almost 54 years. I think going on the road and stuff like that, we might have had some difficulty. Well, it would have been a challenge, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, plus, uh, you know, being on a big label like ATCO, 
sometimes you get lost in the shuffle, you know, sure, where, sure. you know, at least with Ollie and Carla, you know that, you know, you were getting a, a lot of mm -hmm. attention from him, the you label bet. owner, you, you know, bet. he really took care of you guys. Yep, he sure did. Yeah. Um, so going to the songs that you submitted that he uh, liked originally, who was the, was it a group songwriting commitment or who was the main songwriters? Well, I wrote one and uh, Terry Quirk wrote the other. I think that was uh, Run Girl Run, I wrote, and he wrote a song called It Isn't So. And uh, those are the first two. And now on those original two-track things you sent to him, is there a copy of those anywhere? Well, there's a lot. Somewhere. They eventually got released, didn't they? Yeah, the they was much later. Yeah. Uh, after kind of like when Carla and, and, and Ollie's labels were on the downturn. Right. They in came fact, out. In fact, the ones that we recorded on there were very rudimentary because they were there just for him to get the arranger and stuff to get them out. So they, they sound very... Dumbish. Uh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just it wasn't up to any of our... But I think Ollie at the time was searching for something that would maybe make him a few bucks and stuff like that. And right. So they, they never got the proper arrangements and that. Mm -hmm. But writing songs, you know, I, I've written probably the majority of them in the group. Um, but... It's a group effort. I mean, when you write a song, you take it to the group, and you all work your parts. Mm -hmm. And so I don't take credit of being the main songwriter on anything. It's just that everybody puts... So how did you guys work your publishing out? Well, Ollie had his publishing. Ollie took the publishing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys never got any sign of the paychecks coming back from it then? No, 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 Oof. no. But he covered everything. I mean, he would put us up in the best hotels in New York. He would, you know, all of this stuff. I mean, the music business is a cutthroat business. You mm -hmm. all yeah. know that. Well, Ollie got involved in the publishing right off the bat with Del Shannon. Right. When right. you look at those big top singles, yep. all of them have McLaughlin. Yeah, publishing, publishing him, so he yeah. did very well on those. Right, right. and uh, he had brought that up when he said, do you want to start publishing your songs? I said, no way. I said, I want everything to go through you. I mean, he might have kept every bit of money that we have ever made on a record. We were just happy to make records and, you know, yeah. get these gigs around and TV shows just because of what was going on. Well, you were making pretty good money playing live. Right? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, you probably, you know, made, would have made a lot more money doing live gigs and you got on on record yeah you know well, royalties and so on anyway. sort of like tommy james <laughs> yeah, yeah he's right. a, you know with the mob in that he, yeah well he uh, didn't get anything <laughs> well the thing of it is too is that uh, i think bo white told me this uh, he kept contracts up from daniel's den at his right. white's bar he said Do you know you were paid more excels were paid more than bob seeger <laughs> Well, let's look at the state of affairs now. Yeah, right. <laughs> jeez. I thought, jeez. Well, that was nice to hear. So. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. So. It's quite, quite the uh, backstory there. It's interesting yeah. how it all worked out. But you had full trust in them. And how long did you guys go on the road and put out records? Oh, jeez. Well, I, I think the first record was made in 65. And uh, uh, probably through... 69 and then when i left and then i cut one on my own uh feel like trying and did record hops with that but uh yeah um was that through the label too that was i was on enterprise through your manager pardon through your manager still through yeah through uh, ollie was ollie? Still my yeah. manager and but enterprise uh that was a subsidiary of uh, Stax. Stax. Yeah, right. Stax. Oh, my Records. Lord. Wow. Well, I remember, you know, the, um, because uh, um, I think Stax came out with a full page billboard ad. You know, it was in Billboard. And I was the only white guy on that whole thing. They had the <laughs> Isaac Hayes, they had all of these things. And it was yeah. Clark Sullivan. I thought, well. <laughs> Made the headlines anyway. <laughs> Good Irish name there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's, what'd you say, 71, you think? 70? Yeah, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. Wow. How, is that on, uh, it's on, it was on vinyl, obviously. Yeah. A full length album? 
Uh, was there any singles released off that record? No, it was just a single. Oh, it was just a single. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when I was doing that song, when I was doing an overdub uh, for uh, a song we were doing, it's called California on My Mind. And then with uh, Little Innocent Girl, when I went to New York and uh, I would do the overdubs, and that's where I got to meet uh, Ellie Greenwich and Jeff Barry, and they were they were quite pleased with what I was doing, and they s offered me, you know, something to do, you know, either at the Brill Building or that to come with their company, and uh, I just didn't want to leave Ollie. You know, and they were. It was nice. It was very flattering for them to, to me, to have them show an interest in it. But well, and you know, they had just had a pretty impressive track record, not only oh. with all the girl groups, uh -huh. but more recently with Neil Diamond, because yes. all of those early Neil Diamond songs on the Bang label right. were done with Ellie Greenwich and Jeff Barry. Yes, yes, I, I remember. Uh, and we're coming in the studio because Jeff Berry is a tall guy and he yeah. wore cowboy boots. And uh, Ellie, beautiful blonde, you know, and they just thought, uh, these, these are knowledgeable people. They uh, they were involved with a lot of the songs with Phil Spector. Sure. And uh, I thought, geez, that's very complimentary, you know, they even showing interest in me. But there was no way I was going to leave Ollie. I hit or miss, that's the way I was going to go. Now, maybe backtrack a little bit. Uh, you know, the Excels are, are really <clears throat> successful. Um, now, did, when the band split up, did that have anything to do with uh, kind of the teen club scene starting to, uh, I don't know, it just seemed like 1968 into 69, you started to see the teen clubs, which were so big. Mm -hmm you know, from 64 through probably at least 67, uh, you know, they were starting to dwindle, dwindle, disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't, uh, you know, I know Band Canyon, which was a big deal in Bay City, was sold. Uh, the Blue Light in Midland mm -hmm. closed down. I think, I'm not sure when Daniel's Den was sold. Do you remember? Uh, I can't remember. Then it became Elmer's Den. Yeah, but oh. the original owners, right? the Patricks, you know, they sold out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everything was was a little bit different. Did they have anything to do with the band, you know, splitting up? Where you decided to go solo, and the the band tried to carry on? I never decided to go solo. I just had enough, because I was teaching at the time, and like I, I think I told you this before. I mean, I'd come home from school on a Friday night, and drive to Traverse City, play that night, drive back to go to Grand Rapids the next night. You know, and it, it became. Too much, too much. I thought, well, no, I don't want this. And they wanted to go probably to this psychedelic sort of a rock thing, and I didn't have an interest in that, you know. Um, so I just said, you know, we got to part ways here. Yeah, that would would have kind of gone away from doing the the harmony yes. thing. I mean, even the Beach Boys, that was that they, period of time they were you, dead that yeah time you too. really yeah. saw them yeah. kind of go yeah. downhill before yeah. they made a comeback mm -hmm. in the 70s uh just that you know that mm -hmm. yeah that's that's real different well then the band carries on right as the excels well they did for a very little time and then Keo got a hold of them yeah they got involved in the fake zombies thing well i that's one thing i would have never let the band do i hate i have to say that you know, I was uh, more or less the leader of the band, and if something like that came up, especially with the zombies, they're all English guys. None of them had that accent. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do if somebody asks you a question on stage and you know try to have that Cockney accent? It's it doesn't work. <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Yeah, that was that was uh, quite a deal there. And then, of course, the connection with uh, you know the first. Uh, group that Kehoe got to be the zombies. This is the group that had the two future members of ZZ Top. ZZ Top. Frank yeah. Beard and Dusty Hill. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, and they also geez. had the Archies, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. That's yeah. what got them in trouble. Okay. Because they got uh, they got the attention of Don Kirshner, okay. you know, who was a big heavyweight in the music industry. Right. And, of course, Archie Comics, and they didn't have permission, you know, to use either. And... Uh, so that's what really came down. It wasn't, unfortunately, the XLs 
were the ones that got their name in Rolling Stone, and, you know, which kind of tarnished the, the name. <laughs> I was reading Rolling Stone, and then there's a picture of them. Fake zombies. <laughs> in Rolling Stone, <laughs> I thought, oh boy, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I thought they regret it. Oh yeah, very I, much so. They, I, regret you know, it. I talked to Gary Stuckero and uh, and Terry Quirk about it, yeah. and yeah, they said they were naive and they they kind of uh, kind of fell for Kehoe's mm-hmm. line, and you know, he was telling them that you know they eventually. A couple of members of the zombies were going to come and join them. Yep. And, oh, man. Yep. You know. Yep. And they got the name. That, well, it doesn't mean anything. You could, uh, if the Beatles never copyrighted their names, you could go out at the Beatles. You think people would stand for that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, even if, uh, you know, they would have said it was a tribute to the zombies or yeah. a yeah. tribute, you know, that would have been okay. But right. to lead people to believe that, that they were actually seeing the real yeah. McCoy and then it wasn't, you know, even though I guess they were really good, you know, yeah, because well, all those yeah. harmonies that they had perfected over the years yeah, when with you the were zombies, in the band, yeah, 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 they could, yeah. they could duplicate it yeah. much better than the, uh, the first guys, which are, they were basically a Texas blues band. Right. They didn't even have a keyboard. Right. You know? right. right. You know, the zombies, yeah. Rod Argent's keyboard, yeah. it's kind of like, yeah. Yeah, instrument. Yeah, you can't so. do that. Yeah. So yeah. But uh no, that was a sad time for So you got to miss that whole period, thankfully. Thank God. And uh yeah. you were you put out a single. Yeah. What was your next steps after that? Next step after that, I started another band in Flint. Uh it was called Brandywine. And we were playing at this bar in Flint. We were going over good. A group came uh to see us from this country club called Shore Acres. And they wanted us to play out there. And the other guys in the the band at that time, I mean, the band that I started, were teachers from Davis in Michigan. Um, and they didn't want to really play like they're in their Easter break or this and that. Mm-hmm. And I says, well, I can't have this. And I knew that Gary and Howie were living in uh, Lansing. So I got in touch with them. I said, hey, you want to come and join my band? They came out and listened. And yeah. We liked that because they were going to Michigan State at the time. And uh, Ed Rogers was up in Marquette, and uh, we got in contact with Ed, and he was down here the next day, and that became Liberty. And uh, we had a long run and a very good run. Yeah. And you didn't really have to travel, right? I mean, you, you had the same yeah. gig every weekend. And right. really right. didn't have to lug equipment all over the place. Exactly. And, yeah. It was good. I mean, you didn't have to put your guitar in a case. You just put it up on the stand. And <laughs> next night it was still there. Yeah. 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 So. yeah, you could do your teacher thing and without, yeah. you know, but, uh, that much of a problem. In the summer... We would go up to the UP, it's, uh, play a couple of weeks at a place up there, and then uh, we would work in Lansing. And, you know, we didn't uh, we'd like have two weeks off from uh, Shore Acres, but we'd play like in Lansing and up there and just get a little extra stuff going, you know, but we'd play four nights a week at uh, Shore Acres. Did that for, uh, what, seven years? And then... Uh, we played every club in uh, Flint. Some of the big clubs at the time were Contos and Lamplighter and Plush Hobo. We played all of those, and we enjoyed it. We had a great following, and, and the band was really good. And yeah. you probably made pretty good money back in those oh, days, yes. too. Oh, yes. You know, where yeah. you know live music was a real, real big deal. You bet. And paid well. Yep, yep. Uh, Did you run into... Uh, Lafayette and the Sabres. I I've met them. Yeah, Lafayette. Yeah, well, Laugh lives here in Bay City now. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, I've met a lot of these groups. I mean, you know, especially you know, working with uh, Daniel Zen. I remember Terry Knight and the Pack and uh, Dick Wagner and the Bossman. You know, we all played the same venue. Even my buddy Dick Coughlin. You know, he's that's it's with the Cherry Slush. Yeah, Dick was here. Uh, you know, a month, well, it's a couple months ago, right, where Dick was a guest yeah. here mm-hmm. talking about his days in Sherry Slush. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very, very interesting times. You bet, you and, bet. You know, it's so great that uh, there are all these places where kids could get together and yeah. enjoy music together, and that's, you know, that's not available anymore. No, you know? it's not, it's not. And music is not the uh, the gathering force that it was. It, it's, to me, a recording now is sort of mechanical. 
I mean, when they started with drum machines and uh, voice things where they could, you know, tune it, tune, yeah, auto tune, tune. auto tune, right. yeah. Uh, mm. I, I, no, it's it's just not the same. In fact, and to uh, put that into context, now people are starting to buy vinyl more so because it gives you that sound that you you know you're a warmer you're, sound, warmer yeah. sound, you know. yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't have a place for. Uh, uh, young people that want to play music, you know, where do you go? And, you know, back in those days, you know, you could start a band and, you know, rehearse and, you know, get out there and get in front of your peers and play. And, right. you know, it's kind of like a proofing ground, you, you know. Bet. You bet. And they'd let you know, you know, you oh, yes. cover those songs oh, yes. and make it sound like the record. Yep. I mean, that was really the, I think, the, the big test. I mean, how well could you play those the songs of the day mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. was a big one well it, uh, it it was really great for us i mean i think we played just about every venue here in michigan on the west coast the east coast holland grand rapids all that up and down um in detroit and that so we covered a lot of territory and met a lot of people and you know uh, um when you get the people that appreciate the song that you're putting out and you start you know the second time you play there and you got a bigger crowd than the time before it really felt good and right now it's like a whole new different life like somebody had lived that life not me that you know it, mm -hmm. it looks like that because i mean geez we're older now and it just that'll conclude episode one with clark sullivan at mmhp at 989 we want to thank him and his wife bobby for coming through and uh, we're going to pick up where this left off here in two weeks. And uh, Clark's also going to perform some of his songs, too, as well. So please tune back in, catch the rest of this backstory as we keep plugging along here at the MMHP and the 989. And we can't do this without you. So thank you for tuning in. See you soon. The MMHP is hosted on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and our own Libsyn podcast site. You can also search MMHP989 on Facebook for up-to-the-minute information, as well as both Dr. J and Sir Fred's album picks of the week posted every weekend. You can connect with Scott on the web at scottbakermusic.com, Dr. J at michiganrockandrolllegends.com, Sir Fred at fredreif.com, and The Electric Kitsch at electrickitsch.com. This podcast wouldn't be here without special help from Studio 163's Alan Garcia, our podcast videographer and wingman, Mr. Mike Beatty, MMHP tagline specialist, Mr. Eddie Switek, and of course, Gary Johnson, Fred Reif, The Electric Kitsch, and all of our special guests, and especially you listeners. We want to thank you. You've been listening to the MMHP and the 989. From all of us at